The angels cry out, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. The whole earth be filled with his glory. Thank you, Jesus, for the privilege it is to enter into your courts with boldness, with thanksgiving this morning, coming before you as the creator of the universe, as the holy of holies. Let all glory and all honor be yours. thing I ask, one thing I seek, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, to behold the beauty of the Lord. Thank you, Jesus. We, uh, we were lucky enough to go to Coldplay last night, which is unbelievable. Wembley Stadium, 80,000 people. Incredible production. Like, mind-blowing and yet they are the created they are expressing God-given gifts and creativity and stewardship of those things and they can produce such a beautiful experience And yet it pales in significance to standing in the presence of the almighty God. That we can come, that we can close our eyes, lift our hands together. That we can wake up every morning of the week and to step into the glory of the Lord. He is the creator of of the universe, the holy of holies. And he wants to be in relationship with us. He sent Jesus so that we could be in relationship with him, so that we could experience the presence of God and to be filled with the presence of God and to experience his love, his peace, his joy. And so it's such a privilege to be in the house this morning. Father, I just thank you for your word. God, as we come around it this morning, God, let it speak into our hearts. God, let it bring transformation. God, let it bring healing. Let it bring freedom. Father, let us step into a new realm of uh, of understanding and clarity and authority, God, as we walk in step with your spirit. Father, I thank you, God, for an unfolding of your glory, an unfolding of your goodness, an unfolding of your love, Father God, that would just overcome and overwhelm us, God, so that as we are stirred by your spirit, Father, that you would produce dreams and visions and creativity in us, God, that we can walk in and out into this world, into our city, into our workplaces, into our relationships as your hands and your feet. Father, as people who carry the presence of the almighty God. We love you and we praise you this morning. In Jesus' mighty name, everybody said, amen, amen. Why don't you turn, say hi to somebody as you take your seat. Wonderful to have you in church. So good to be here together. So we come around this morning, thank you, Chess, thank you, team. Can we thank the worship team? That was beautiful, <laughs> wonderful. We, uh, yep, we were at Coldplay yesterday for Lucy's birthday, so I just want to say happy birthday. We, you did forget birthdays, that's all right. I can say happy birthday. It's also Claire, Claire's, she's in a, she, on Tuesday, and then Jay is on Wednesday. This is just a week of birthdays. Very cool. And looking forward, to, uh, looking forward to heading to the Thames later on for Sammy. Baptism is going to be a very uh, special moment. So it's, uh, it's a privilege to be a part of that, mate. So great to have you. And great to have Jeffrey here this morning, friend of Sammy's, and Sammy's mom, Christina. So good to have you with us. It's going to be great to head down to the Thames. And we pray for clarity of water uh, in the Thames as we dunk him. It's going to be very cool. So we continue our uh, Fruit of the Spirit series this morning, 
Um, let me let me wheel this out here a little bit, just for those who are visually impaired. Uh, Lucy doesn't have her glasses, which is the main thing, and she's on the front row. So, uh, so, but this morning we move into the last of the nine fruit, which is self-control. And so I know we all cringe a little bit at that one for some reason. It's like, so are you self-controlled? Because I think it feels like it feels like more work than the rest, which is an interesting way of, I think, that we just see it in our humanity. Um, but self-control this morning, which is going to be really cool. I hope that you have really uh, got a lot out of this series. I think um, as we've walked through it, um, I just really hope that it's helped shape your understanding and vision for what it means to walk with Jesus, for what these fruits actually are and the outworking of them in our life, that they're not just behaviors that we should be doing or walking in, but they are actually a result of walking with the Spirit. It's not something that we force ourselves to, to produce, but as we lean into God and into our relationship with the Spirit, that He produces this fruit in us so that as the scripture said, taste and see that the Lord is good, so that those around us would actually taste and see that the Lord is good. That this is not, and I'll speak about this a little bit this morning, this is not about project self. The fruit of the Spirit isn't about project self. It's not about actually improving yourself. It's about relationship with the Holy Spirit. And as we walk in step with the Spirit, He produces His nature in us so for the benefit of and for the purpose of those around us. It's actually not for you. The fruit is for other people to taste and see because inside that fruit is the seed of the kingdom of God. The DNA of heaven resides in each of these fruit so that as we walk around as trees, dropping fruit, that the people around us would taste and see the nature and character of who God is as we express love, as we, as we express peace, as we are kind, as we are gentle. These are not just impotent character traits or behaviors. They are powerful to carry the very DNA of God to carry the DNA of heaven. And so self-control, as we get to that this morning, it's not just a willpower thing to make myself a better person. There is a power that resides in the fruit of self-control in our life to actually exemplify the nature of God. So this morning we're going to come around talking in and around this idea of self-control, but each week we've been hearing from a different person, and so this morning uh, we are very privileged to have Beck Quee coming to share on self-control, so why don't you welcome her as she comes. <laughs> Beck, you can just grab that from EJ. Thanks. All yours. Perfect. Hi, everyone. I'm Beck. Hi, Beck. I'm going to talk about self-control for a sec. So like Phil just said, I think self-control sometimes can come across as one of the more negative fruits of the Spirit, like love, joy, gentleness, you know, they all sound a bit more exciting, <laughs> a bit more doable, um, whereas self-control feels a little bit more demanding. So I guess it's easy for it to be pushed aside or ignored or, yeah, just kind of thought a bit less of because it feels harder to achieve. But it's in the list, so it must be important. <laughs> Um, I think self-control is very much linked to obedience. It requires self-awareness. It requires intentional action. It requires patience, which is another fruit. Um, and it requires us to look beyond the present moment. I have this story that I wrote down after a day at Bible college back in 2016 about something I was thinking about while I was driving to work. And while the example is a little bit frivolous, um, in that moment it represented a bigger concept for me and it helped me to understand. So I'm going to read what I wrote. Yesterday, I was driving to work thinking about the sacrifice and obedience of Christ on the cross. Earlier in chapel, the pastor was talking about consecration and how God desires our obedience and sacrifice. 
in life, God would rather us be obedient to his voice and will than for us to sacrifice whatever it may be. He wants our hearts and a willingness to listen and obey our Lord before anything else. It brought me to Jesus. Before the sacrifice he made, there had to be an act of obedience for it to even occur. Jesus sat in that garden and wept. Blood welled from his face in such fear, yet he said, not I will, but your will be done. Mm. In life, we'll come across many decisions we need to make, and we must learn to hear God's voice amongst it all. As I drove, I opened a packet of M&Ms, a tiny packet. But at the start of the 40-minute drive, I said to myself that there still had to be one left in the packet when I arrived at work. It it was an experiment. (laughs) I thought about obedience and self-control and how it's sometimes hard, but it can be done. And I related this to like real-life choices and the ways to live. Again, I thought of Jesus. In Hebrews 12, 2, it says, For the joy set before him, he endured the cross, scorning its shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Jesus obeyed, not only to atone for the world's sins because he loves us, but because he knew that after it was finished, there was a great blessing. Eternity, life, no more blood and tears. I wondered about how we as people can let that joy motivate us. Can that be our motivation for obedience? Knowing joy and blessing will follow. I think to an extent it can, because we know that even if our act of obedience is hard, like Jesus's was, it will benefit us in the long run. We must learn to be obedient and have self-control out of a submitted heart, not a forceful, because I have to heart. But we can see that the joy set before us, we can see the joy set before us and walk towards it in faith. I, have to, I arrived at work with two M&Ms left in the packet, <laughs> and I ate them with delight. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> delight that I'd had self-control. Thinking that was it, I walked into the office to find two big brownies sitting on my desk waiting for me. That was the joy set before me. Though I couldn't see it, nor was I expecting that, there was a blessing for my obedience. While that example is small, in that moment for me, it taught me a bigger lesson of obedience and self-control and helped me to see another facet of Jesus and how he looked beyond the present moment and obeyed the call upon his life for a much greater purpose. You never really know what's on the other side of obedience, of taking a controlled step back for a moment to see other options and to see a bigger picture. Galatians 5.25 says, Since we live by the Spirit, let us keep in step with the Spirit. I think that's a key to self-control. We step, we listen, we wait. We step, we listen, we wait, we step. It's being in tune with him. It's spending the time with him. It's learning how to hear his voice and being obedient to to what we hear, despite what other people or voices or things might be pulling us toward. It's saving that last Eminem. Beautiful. Come on. Thank you, Quee. Save the last Eminem. All right, so self-control, as we have, there's uh, just to help us ground some of this is just the uh, definitions. So this Greek one, ekatreus, it's ekatreia, uh, or oh, there's, there's too many S's in that word, um, <laughs> Poish, potion, possession is meant to be, possession or power over yourself is essentially what that word means, so the synonym, temperance, contentedness or sufficiency and the antonyms being excess, self-indulgence and senseless, senselessness. There's so many S's on that page. <laughs> yeah, no, no, I didn't. No, always use Grammarly, people. Okay, so, so um, what's, uh, and if we go to the next one, no, not that one. Turn that one off. No, turn that one off. What? No, you're missing one. That's all right. Turn them all off. All right. So, okay. So, uh, so the definition uh, here is self-control is restraint exercised over one's own impulses, emotions, or desires, uh, and a and a very kind of baseline uh, psychology definition is the ability to manage one's impulses, emotions, and behaviors to achieve long-term goals, uh, and it's what separates humans from the rest of the animal kingdom. 
in a very secular kind of way of looking at things. But we see it all through Scripture. We see it in uh, 1 Corinthians 9 where Paul talks about an athlete. He, he uses the metaphor of us being athletes and that we exercise self-control in all things to receive uh, a, a they, re- they do it to receive a perishable wreath, but we do it to receive an imperishable one. And it talks about it in, in qualifications of, of leadership as overseers, as deacons, that they be uh, stewards and above reproach, not arrogant, quick-tempered, or drunk or violent, but that they would show hospitality and self-control. And I, I do, sometimes you look at self-control in this list of fruit and it feels like it sits out of place. But I think ultimately it bookends love. It's almost like, it's almost like the, the bow on, that finishes off the gift, right? If love is the initiator and you have joy, peace, patience all flow out of love, then it is actually self-control that allows all of those things to operate within the context of community. Because we, what Paul is addressing here to the church in Galatians is actually... Uh, unity within the body and, and relationships and how that was all to function in a healthy way. So self-control actually allows, it kind of is the, is the full stop on the end of all of those fruit because it is our ability to display and walk in self-control that actually kind of lands my ability to love and to show peace and to be kind and gentle and all of these different things. But I think ultimately self-control is um, based in this concept of desire, that we have these things in us that we all struggle with and we sometimes don't know if we'll ever really find full peace because there's always something that we're struggling with, that we're working on. But the good news is, 1 Corinthians 10, 3, that no temptation has overtaken you that is not common to man. So we are all, we look at some people and go, oh man, they've just got it all together. They've mastered, but they haven't. We are all, we all suffer temptation and we all struggle with different areas of our life, whatever they may be, that we wrestle with. And we're all in the same boat. But as we go through on this journey of spiritual transformation in our relationship with God, part of the development of who we are as people is based around this this idea of what we do with our desire. And this comes out in all sorts of um, different worldviews. It's not just... I guess a Christian one, that self-control is something that is, that is a, a virtue in many different beliefs and worldviews. Uh, so to help us define kind of desire, it comes in two main views, and these are kind of the, the polar ends of it. So you've got one, so if we've got that screen there, hedonism, which is essentially human be- behavior motivated desires to increase pleasure and decrease pain. So hedonism says, you do you. Desire is there to be expressed. So if you have a desire, do it. It's to be released into the world because it's, it's in you, why not? And then the opposite side to that is religion, which is behavior in relation to, which, to that which is regarded as holy, sacred, absolute. And that's just not necessarily talking about Islam, Christianity. We all live by some kind of set of rules and religion. So, you know, I've, with people in our worlds who will be self-controlled because of fear of the result. There's a karma or whatever it is. So there is still a... It's essentially got a fear base to it. So hedonism has got like this, you do you, and then the other side of the coin, the other side of the pendulum is this idea of religion where I don't do certain things because of fear of what may occur. And my prayer this morning is that we wouldn't 
that we kind of see through the fallacy and lies of what is very much a secular concept of desire and just doing whatever you want, but also at the same time not being, uh, not being fooled by the religion the religious concept, which is also one that is a self-righteousness, but that we would have a, and what I want to put to you this morning is this compelling image that Jesus provides us, which is one of surrendering our desires to Jesus for the sake of others. And this idea of hedonism, Paul talks about in 2 Timothy says, but understand this, that in the last days there will become times of difficulty for people will be lovers of, uh, lovers of, well, will be lovers of, that doesn't make sense. My, my, I have not done spell check this morning. Lovers of money, proud, arrogant, abusive, disobedient to their parents, ungrateful, unholy, heartless, unappeasable, slanderous, without self-control, brutal, not loving, good, treacherous, reckless, swollen with conceit, lovers of pleasure, having the appearance of godliness but denying its power. Sounds very much like today, doesn't it? Sounds very much like the world in which we live. And we are on this downward slope of whatever is good for you, go on and do it. Whatever you feel like doing, that's right to you. So, Who's to tell you no? And so we, we live in this, like I mentioned, this concept of project self. But it's essentially saying that the world, the world is this blank canvas for my life, right? My own self-definition, my own expression, my own enjoyment. And I get to determine what's good. I get to determine what matters. And society exists to maximize my personal possibilities, right? That's how most of the world thinks. And if anything gets in the way of that, well, I'm going to war with it because that's oppression. But the thing, and when we start to look at the biblical concept and, we, and you look into... Uh, different reasons, and I, and I chatted about this at the start of the series, is that we have these base order desires in us, these natural desires. But then we also have second order desires, which is our ability to want something better. And then there's a thing called, um, called secondary order volition, which is our ability to, provide, to override our baseline desire with our second order desire, so, i.e. to exercise self-control and willpower to choose a better thing. So that, and that in itself is actually true freedom. When Paul talks in Galatians about works of the flesh, or, com, or he talks about them in other, other frames of being like the, the commands of the flesh, that is actually what we, if we are constantly giving into the commands of the flesh, we are actually walking in slavery. Because tr- freedom is actually the ability to choose not just a giving in to my defaults on a continual basis. That leads to addiction and destruction. And we live in a society that is all about freedom, and yet the result of freedom is an epidemic of addiction, anxiety, stress. And so it is not, the answer is not do whatever you want. The answer somewhere exists in this ability to be transformed and to overcome a default desire and step into something better. So we live in a world that says, obey your desire, do what you want, release it, follow your passion. And yet we live in a society that is devastated by addictions and Proverbs 25 28 says a man without self-control is like a city broken into and left without walls what are walls for to protect the inhabitants living inside 
to protect it from external forces. So without self-control, we don't have the walls of protection, so any threat can come in and terrorize our hearts and our souls. And then you get the, the flip side of that, so the way of religion, which is ultimately a way of fear. It's the fear of desire. And so I will put all these things in place, and I won't do this, and I won't do that, because of the fear of what those desires might mean for me. Colossians 2, verse 20 says, If with Christ you died to the elemental spirits of the world, why, as if you were still alive in the world, do you submit to regulations? Do not handle, do not taste, do not touch. They have the appearance of wisdom in promoting self-made religion and asceticism and severity to the body, but they are of no value in stopping indulgence of the flesh. See, the Pharisees in the New Testament were were the ones who upheld the law. And they were so scared of breaking the law that they created a whole other book of laws that so you, you wouldn't even, if the cliff is there, they set the laws so far back that you wouldn't even get close. And so people lived within these tight restraints of law for the fear of doing anything wrong, but it became about the law, not the original reason for the law. And so they put in place these external rules and it became about behavior modification. But behavior modification itself doesn't change the heart. Jesus didn't come for us to be good people. He didn't come so that bad people would become good. Jesus came to make dead people alive. To actually awaken us into our true identity, our true vocation, our true purpose, to receive true freedom, to not be slaves to the desires and sin and those things that cause so much destruction in our life. But the religious will claim the moral high ground and say, look at me, live like me, and yet, like Jesus said, you you clean the outside of the bowl but the inside is still dirty. And they would become these people in society that love to be looked on as the high and the moral and the elite, and yet he says that they they ignored the matters of the heart. And it's interesting because I think the religious of our world today fight for so many rights of the moral and the elite. And I think we should. There is, a, there is a place for it. But it's also the wrong approach in a, in a lot of ways because laws restrict and they govern, but they don't, they don't heal the heart. They, 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 offer, a, they offer a sense of, uh, of protection A lot of the time when we talk about self-control, our heads go to sexual sin for whatever reason. Am I being pure in this area or the other? And ultimately, self-control is so much more than that. We need to be controlled in our thought life, in our speech, in our actions. But what Jesus says to them here is you you hypocrites you clean the outside you don't deal with the matters of greed and self-indulgence we don't deal with our pride we don't deal with our all these these things is gossip and different things in us that are ang- our anger we don't deal with these things we look at stuff that has an outward appearance to it we look at stuff that people can see not necessarily the things on the inside when we talk about self control when i'm talking about this concept this morning take this stuff into account that it's the self control in who i am in my in my heart and so yeah so the religious battle for laws and governance but if I, if there is somebody who uh, you know down the saying on, on the sexual topic. If, if I was to, if we were to fight against laws that create a freedom for pornography, 
does that heal the issue of lust in mankind? Absolutely not. It creates a level of protection and access, but it doesn't actually produce healing. And so what Jesus and Paul are saying is, yes, there is, there is good in the law, but Jesus came to fulfill the law. He came to push past that. He came to bring an element of power and freedom in self-control that is far beyond just setting rules for your life. So religion fails because it doesn't give us a new desire. It's about stopping doing things, but it actually doesn't replace in our heart new desires. It's about control, whereas though grace is about surrender. And the religious spirit doesn't like grace because it doesn't seem fair. But that's what Jesus came to lead us into, was into grace. And so, Jesus came to offer us a third option, which is this life-giving way. This way for us to lay down and to surrender our desires and hand them over to him so that he can then transform us. So it's not just the ability to manage my emotions, my impulses, my behaviors in order to achieve my long-term goals, as the world would say. But self-control is actually about transformation of my life for something much bigger. Because the world will talk about self-control as in a, a discipline that leads you towards freedom. Suck it up, lead yourself, you know. Be the, be the better version of you. Be the best version of you that you can be. But Jesus' vision of self-control is actually one that is self-control for the sake of others, not for self. All the fruit of the Spirit are actually outward-facing. self Self-control, the fruit of self-control in my life is actually not about me. It's not about project self. Self-control, and as it is produced as a fruit in my life, is actually about the people around me. And there's this beautiful uh, definition by John Tyson, which I think we've got a screen for. It says that he defines uh, self-control as sacrificial stewardship of the self for the sake of others. So it's the redirecting of desire and passion so that we are formed into the image of Jesus for the sake of others. It's not even self-control so that I can be a better version of myself. That's us bringing our Western individualistic mentality into Scripture and saying, I'm just going to be the better version of me for the sake of Jesus. That's not even it. It's that I'm becoming more like Jesus for the sake of everybody in this room. For every single person that I encounter on the street. There's a total other motivation to it. Christianity is one of the only worldviews, if not the only worldview, that will actually rip down your good behaviors if they're not done for the right motivation. They mean nothing if they are not if they don't have Jesus at the core of them. They become a work. And we live in a world that's obsessed with freedom, but there's two types of freedom. There's negative freedom and there's positive freedom. So negative freedom is a freedom from something, but a positive freedom is a freedom to something. I'm set free to, not just, I'm not set free just so I can do whatever I want. I'm set free so that I can. So the biblical vision of freedom is this freedom to become our full redemptive selves, to become, to walk into our full redemptive potential, to become more like Jesus so that we can sacrificially use this for the benefit and good of everybody else around us. It's not project self. It's project earth. It's project Jesus. That's, that's why 
it's not I'm just becoming a good person so that I can be a good, become a good person and so, that, and so that God will receive me or look at me in a positive light. Grace already has done that. Jesus has already accomplished that. And so because of that freedom, I'm now free to. I'm not, I am free from, but I'm free from because I'm, fr- because I'm free to. It's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a releasing of who we are as people, as children of God, so that we can walk in the things of Jesus. And as Queen spoke about in Romans 12, it says, don't be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind. Present your bodies as living sacrifices. This Galatians 5, we've been reading from verse 15 a lot, but you go back to verse 13, and this is where the fruit of the Spirit is framed. Before, before you get into the context of works of the flesh and fruit of the Spirit, it says, For you were called to freedom, only to not use your freedom as an opportunity for the flesh, but through love serve one another. For the whole law is fulfilled in one word, uh, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. And then it bookends with, and those who belong to Jesus Christ have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. If we live by the Spirit, let us keep in step with the Spirit. It opens, this whole context of the fruit opens with, don't use your freedom for yourself. You're, you are free for the sake of everybody else. You are free. I love this, uh, this um, st- you know, it's a terrible story, but the, of the 13 kids that were trapped in the cave in Thailand, and there's a, there's a great documentary on it called The Rescue, and there's a new cinematic pro- production, but I love in The Rescue at the end of the documentary, there's one of the guys, and these are like, what comes out is that it, the British guys that saved these 13 kids out of the cave, and they, but they were, it comes out in the story that they were just social outcasts. They were weird. They were, you know, but they had given their life to a certain skill. And one of them at the end, almost in tears, is like, this was what I was made for. And these disciplines and habits and things that they'd set up in their life, the skill that they developed was for the sake of saving the lost saving these kids who had got trapped in this cave and would have died otherwise. This beautiful picture of the things that we give our life to and the people that we become actually has people at the end of it. That's the point of it. So we are called to sacrificially steward ourselves for the sake of others. Not for, the, not for control's sake, not control ourselves for the sake of self. But it doesn't happen by accident. And there's a war for your soul, which is why this self-control thing can feel so heavy sometimes, because the enemy comes with condemnation when stuff goes wrong. It's like, how did you do that again? I thought you were free. Where, Where is your growth? And this condemnation thing comes so strong and that's why one of, the, one of the greatest tools around self-control is not more hard work, it's not more disciplines, but it's a sense of identity. Jesus was attacked in his identity. He came to him, the, the enemy came to him and challenged his identity. Are you really the son of God? Will God really and so when we're coming, when we're leaning into the Spirit and walking with the Spirit, it's, it's a, an increase of this sense of identity in who I am. So that when I, when I come against certain things, my identity actually takes, takes over. My sense of identity becomes a resistance against the things that I don't want to walk in and I know I shouldn't. It's like you come to uh, uh, somebody who battles with smoking addiction, and someone comes and says, hey, do you want another smoke? The response can be, oh, no, I'm trying to quit. But what that's saying is, I'm still a smoker, but I'm trying to quit. Whereas uh, if you're working from a place of identity, so I'm not a smoker. 
Do you want another smoke? I'm not a, I'm not a smoker. And it's, it's kind of a, it's a reinforcing. So for us in our life, it's kind of this reinforcing of who we are in Jesus. So when we come against times of pressure, I'm a saint. I'm a child of God. I'm a saint. I don't need to. I choose, I choose the better thing because of the people around me. I choose this over that because of you. And so it, there's this sense of identity that rises in us, which actually then gives us the power to overcome. Those who are born of God overcome the world. There is a, there is a birthing that happens in the Holy Spirit that actually then empowers us to have self-control. And there is a war for it. 1 Peter 2 says, uh, Beloved, I urge you as sojourners, as sojourners and exiles to abstain from the passions of the flesh which wage war against your soul. There is an attack against your soul and it comes at times of weakness. There's an acronym called um, BHALT which is essentially these times where we are weak. So when we're bored, hungry, angry, lonely, or tired. <laughs> That's when you're at your weakest. And it, can be, and it can be really hard to stay on track when you're in any one of those different categories. And sometimes we're, we have all of them at once. <laughs> yeah, bo- bored, hungry, angry, lonely, tired. I was that yesterday. <laughs> no, I wasn't. It was Lucy's birthday. <laughs> the day before. So we fight and we strengthen ourselves and we strengthen self-control through this sense of identity. We resist not out of willpower but out of identity. This recognition that I'm a saint. Paul says over and over throughout the New, New Testament this phrase, in Christ. I'm in Christ. So that's where the location of our lives are. I'm not a sinner. I'm in Christ. If you've been raised with Christ, then seek the things that are above where Christ is seated. I have the mind of Christ. Remind yourself, when you get onto a downward spiral of thoughts, I have the mind of Christ. In Timothy, it says that we don't have a spirit of fear, but of love, power, and a sound mind. There's a, there there is a, it starts in our mind. The spiral starts in our thinking and it's a renewing of our thinking. And, but we also need, there's also an ability to create environments around us that help that. Community, devotion, accountabilities, all these different things do help us as we walk into the spirit for people to actually help us along the way. Because the myth is is that weak people need systems and structures and strong people can rely on willpower alone. But that's rubbish. We all, we all, need, we all need structure. We all need each other. We're not built to live alone. We're not built to live by ourselves. We're built to, to live in and amongst each other and to support one another in and through this. Lucy and I have started going back to the gym but we do it together because otherwise I wouldn't get up in the morning, right? I have a couple of times, but like when we go together, there's, a, there's an environment for me to get fitter, for me to get stronger. We, we can set up these environments in our life. So, Self-control is not about project self. It's not about you becoming a better person. Self-control is a fruit of the Spirit. And as the band come up, it's a fruit of the Spirit that is produced in us as we walk in step with the Spirit. It's not I work myself into it. And there may be things that you are struggling, that you do struggle with on a repeated basis. Things that you know are desires, they're your default ones. 
and you're trying to step into this, you know, secondary volition where I have the power to choose the better decision over the default one. And if I can encourage you in anything that has helped me is the spiritual discipline of prayer. When I find myself in times of pressure, stress, when I'm bored, hungry, (laughs) lonely, tired, is to actually remind myself who I am, that I'm a child of God, that I'm a saint, that my that Jesus has come to cover all of the mistakes that I have made and ever will, so it doesn't impact the way that he loves me. I can call myself a saint completely, confidently and boldly because of what Jesus has done. So I take that identity on and then I turn to God and I talk to him. You may need to take yourself out of certain environments. You might need to set up different structures for yourself. In times of stress and if things are going wrong, you might need to step yourself literally out of the situation and then go and pray. Take it to God. Drop it at His feet. Because I find as soon as I go, if I'm whatever is going on, If I can, in that moment, be renewed in my thinking, to step out of that moment of weakness, anger, whatever it is, and to actually turn to God and say, it might be just as simple as God, help me. Then I'm filled with a power from heaven that is not my own willpower. It's not me working through it. It's not me just striving to become a better person, but I take on the very presence of heaven and the spirit overcomes the flesh and I can reset and I can renew. You know, in Ephesians 6, it talks about the armor of God. But at the end of that list, it says praying at all times in the spirit. So you're putting on the helmet, the breastplate, the belt, all these things that protect us. But in it all is this ability to pray, to go to God, to bring Him in to whatever is going on. So why don't we stand to our feet? You may... uh, There may be people in here this morning that would say, I'm, I feel like I'm being dominated at times. I feel like I'm not, I'm not over, overcoming this thing or it keeps coming back or I keep falling in this way. And I've been trying, I've been striving, but I need help. And so this morning, I believe that as we speak, in and around walking in the spirit and self-control that there's anointing here this morning to break those yokes of slavery and wrong thinking. So if that's you, with every eye closed, every head bowed, if that is you this morning, why don't you just lift your hands? It could be anything that you're struggling with. You just keep returning back to it. Let me just pray over each one of us because I believe Jesus wants to redirect us. He wants to bring us to a place of healing. He wants to bring us to a place of change and transformation. So Holy Spirit, produce in us the fruit of self-control. Lead us into life, life in the Spirit, that our lives become story and a testimony come Holy Spirit fill us with your power fill us with the fruit of self-control Father not for our own 
efforts, our own sense of self-worth or achievement or religious mindsets. But Father, fill us with your spirit right now so that we can truly become more like you, Jesus, to become people that walk in the power of the spirit who become the hands and the feet of Jesus. That our self-control is not for ourself. That our self-control is for the benefit and blessing of the society and the community and the relationships that we live in. So Father, I declare freedom this morning in the name of Jesus. I declare freedom from the Holy Spirit that only you can bring, Holy Spirit. Speak into hearts and minds this morning. Father, let there be an unlocking. Let there be a release. Father, I declare an anointing for release this morning. God, from anger, from greed, from lust, from unforgiveness, from these things that hold us. Father, I speak freedom in Jesus' mighty name. I speak the power of the Holy Spirit to release, to unlock, to break off, those handles and holes that have been on people's hearts and minds. And Father, I declare freedom this morning. Freedom, not just freedom from, but freedom to. Father, a freedom that brings a sense of vocation, a freedom that brings a sense of purpose and mission, a freedom that brings hope with it. It brings joy with it. It brings peace with it. Father God, I declare this morning over each and every life here this morning, Father, a a new mantle of anointing. God, that each one of these fruit, as we come to the end of this series, Father, just pray, Lord, that we would walk in step with the Spirit. Father, that we would recognize that you have not sent Jesus. Jesus, you did not come so that I can be a good person. You came that I could be a person of presence. You came, you died, you rose again so that I could be completely and fully restored, that I would become fully alive, that the devil comes to steal, kill, and destroy, but you came to bring life and life to the full. Father, that we as a church community would experience life to the full as we walk in step with the Spirit. Thank you, Jesus.